is it morning? It doesn't matter. What matters is, let's be clear. This is a show designed to, to attack fuzzy thinking. This is a show to get rid of all of the myths and garbage that we hear peddled as truth uh, and get down to just the nuts and bolts of a thing. What are we really saying about a thing? What does it really mean? Why can't we just be clear about a thing? Why can't we really uh, let logic lead us to where we need to go? Let's put aside what we believe about an issue for a moment and let's hear both sides of, a, of an issue and let the presenters speak well and then you can come up with what you believe. Does it, does it shake you? Does it change you? Does it fortify you? Let's be clear. This is a show where we work on thinking. And in order to work on thinking, we should take the events of the day, the news of the day, and we should take a position on it. And with that, I have some great folk. And, and I am State Senator James Sanders Jr. And if anybody needs to be clear, I need to be clear. Uh, but I have some great people here who are going to speak. And um, we have Dr. Peter Kraska, who is a professor of the School of Justice Studies at Eastern Kent Kentucky University. Uh, pleasure to see you, sir. We have Mr. Mark Claxton. He is the Director of Public Relations and Political Affairs at the Black Law Enforcement Alliance. A pleasure to see you again, sir. Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, I am going to turn this over. Today, we're going to speak about no-knock warrants. This issue has been bubbling around for the longest, but really came to light with the untimely killing of Breonna Taylor uh, and the use and or misuse of no-knock warrants there. But Professor Kraska, what is what is a no-knock warrant, and why are you against these things? It's good to see you. Uh, like you said, Pete Kraska, uh, I've been studying uh, the larger issue of police militarization for a long time, in fact, since uh, 1988. And uh, but the most obvious and clear example of police militarization is this act of the police uh, uh, conducting a surprise dynamic entry on people's private residences. So in other words, executing a search warrant in such a way that the people inside don't know what's happening. Oftentimes these are these like they did with Brianna Taylor, these uh, uh, no-knock raids occur at night, sometimes at four o'clock in the morning. And the idea is that the police can catch these people in the middle of rapid eye movement sleep, sleep and really surprise them and not give them an opportunity to act in any kind of way against the police. These things have been going on for a long time. They really started in a serious way towards the end of the Ronald Reagan drug war and then kicked in in a big way during the 1990s uh, war on drugs and crack. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's been the, the, the tragedies that have been associated with this have been mounting for a long time. And I've been involved with a lot of those cases over the years, but I've never seen the kind of interest and concern that we see today uh, because of what uh, the Louisville Police Department did in, uh, in the Breonna Taylor case. So, Mr. Claxton, you've heard that and he's won you over and, and there's no longer a debate on this. We could all go home. <laughs> and so you agree with Pete? I agree with, uh, with everything that he pointed out, I, I, I see his perspective quite clearly and I understand his perspective. And I understand and agree with him that there's been an increased the militarization of our police forces. His timeline is, uh, is, is accurate, you know, based on my experience. I'm a retired uh, detective in the uh, NYPD uh, and I've done uh, uh, many uh, no-knock search warrants, especially with the main purveyors of of no knock uh, 
search warrants and execution of no-knock search warrants. I think what's important to point out is that the, the convergence of no-knock search warrants and what's, what's called the Castle Doctrine uh, causes great conflict and difficulty. It's, it's almost impossible, if you will, to accept that you would execute no-knock warrants and still have a castle doctrine in place because those things really can't coexist, if you will. But from a practical police perspective and understanding that the, the primary purpose of no-knock warrants should be, uh, for, the exclusive purpose of no-knock warrants should be to, to, for the safety and security of the individuals involved in the warrant, namely the police officers, uh, and the element of surprise, it's important to always have that tool in the toolbox. I think that it is not the no-knock search warrant itself that leads to the, the, the tragedies of Brianna Taylor and others. It is the misuse and the misapplication of those. I think it's quite clear that, that there is an abuse, as Mr. Kraska indicated, of no-knock warrants. So. I'm always hesitant to remove that tool, which the element of surprise should, uh, in, the, in the form of no-knock search warrant, should always be there available to police professionals, but it should be because there exists a high risk or danger of, of, of death uh, if we don't use that element of surprise. What we should do is to add additional safeguards. We should make applications for no-knock warrants based on uh, the individual police officer's ability to articulate to a judge quite clearly that this is about uh, safety of the police officers. We need it for that reason only. We don't need it just so we get to jump so you don't flush your drugs down the toilet. We don't need it because we're trying to catch you before you go running out the door. Exclusively, no-knock warrants should be used exclusively, totally, and absolutely in, in those rare situations where the element of surprise is necessary in order to protect and preserve human life. And that includes the police officers' lives. So my position is, is supporting no-knock warrants, recognizing the current abuse and misuse of them, but supporting that tool in the toolbox to, be, to have available uh, if there are circumstances uh, that it could be used to protect and preserve human life. Well, isn't that, Mr. Kraska, isn't that what's happening now? I mean, that's what's on the books. It, uh, that's only supposed to be used. And isn't that what the situation is now? And what is this Castle Doctrine anyway? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, and I think Mr. Claxton and, and I may come to a consensus sooner than, uh, <laughs> sooner than, than the show needs. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that it's critical to recognize that right now, currently in the US, this is a very conservative figure and it's based on research I did a long time ago and then I've been tracking these things since, that the police are conducting about 60,000 of these types of raids a year. And they're not for the most uh, uh, in, in, in motion dangerous situations. What they're for are fishing expeditions to look for poss the possibility that somebody has drugs or contraband in their residence. And our research shows that only about 50% of the time do they even find any evidence. So you got 60,000 of these things taking place. I, I, I agree, they're really a uh, potentially, particularly with the Castle Doctrine, they're a risky type of thing to engage in. And, uh, and the bulk of them, 90% of them, are done for minor drug infractions. Now, to be clear, if the police encounter a terrorist situation, a active shooter, somebody just killed 12 people and then runs into their apartment and they're not sure if they're there or not, they get a, a no-knock warrant, and go get and go to that situation and do a dynamic entry, absolutely justified. That's one of those, as Mr. Claxton said, a rare incident that that it's that it's necessary to do one. 
But that's not the issue. And that's not the problem facing the United States and particularly uh, uh, communities of color. What the issue is, is having uh, police departments that have made this normalized and routine. And they do 25 to 100, some police departments I've seen and, and worked with and some testifying against up to 500 of these types of raids a year. That's, that's where it becomes problematic and that's where things get out of control. And by the way, that's exactly what happened in Louisville. In Louisville, the LMPD got used to doing these things all the time. They had boilerplate language that they would send to a judge. They would, get a, they would either get a no-knock warrant or they would get a regular knock and announce warrant and execute it as if it was a no-knock. And that's as much of a problem. They got a regular knock and announce warrant. They're supposed to come up, knock on the door, say, hey, this is the police. We have a warrant. We need to search your place. Instead, they walk up and they know that they're going to do a dynamic entry almost immediately after they knock on the door. And some, some of us call that a quick knock, but it's essentially a, a dynamic force, a surprise force entry, just like a no knock is. And uh, there's some evidence that that's what happened in Louisville. So uh, I'll, let, I'll, I'll let Mr. Claxton get into the castle doctrine. I don't want to talk too much. <laughs> well. What is this castle doctrine? We've been we've been speaking around it for the longest. Is this a man's house? Is his castle? Is this what we're talking about? That's it. That's exactly it, <laughs> Senator Sanders. And the extension of that is, since it's my castle, I have a right to to use the necessary level of force to protect and defend it. And that means if, if sounds I'm, like Florida, doesn't it? it you stand your ground. Uh, it, it is. It is an extension of that. It's. It's an element of that, and 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 what it does is it puts a, uh, a person inside of their home, inside of their castle, at a point where they are they have an absolute right to defend against incursion, and a no knock warrant. If you're in, in bed sleeping, you know you had REM sleep, and 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 there's a your door is broken down. It is reasonable to assume that someone's, you know going to do harm to you, et cetera, and you have a right based on the, on the castle doctrine to defend yourself and your 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 place, your home uh, from that incursion. And so you can see quite clearly that if you apply both of those principles uh, uh, precisely, the castle doctrine is your right to defend yourself and <laughs> the police's right to use no knock warrant, it's a recipe for disaster. Uh, Mr. Kraska is so on point, and I don't want to line jump here. I'm, 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 I'm dancing on that line, but I don't want to line jump, but he's made some really critically important uh, points about the, the overuse and abuse of no-knock warrants, and that really is what has happened. And you don't want to get to the point where you, you tell the police, law enforcement agencies, uh, what you abuse, you lose. You see, it could be a helpful tool, but if you abuse that tool, you're going to lose it. Uh, and, and that would be fine if, if, if the repercussions, uh, you know, weren't necessarily possibly fatal. Uh, I think that's that may be the situation here. But I agree with Mr. Kraska. I can count on one hand how many times, how many uh, knock and announce warrants I've been involved in. But I've been involved in tens and dozens of no knock warrants because it became routine. When we said we're going to execute a warrant, it was assumed, it was automatic that it would be a no knock warrant. Now, here's the problem that, I, as I see it, it really should be up to that particular judge who I go before with my application to for a warrant. Uh, that judge should really scrutinize the information that I'm giving them. Now, the problem is that under normal circumstances, you're going before a judge and many, you know, especially with the larger departments, like New York, for example, NYPD, for example, you're, you're going before a judge who's in the middle of arraigning cases, who's going to take five minutes out of arraign, arraigning cases to take a few seconds to hear you, your application, so they can sign the paper and send you on your way and do your warrant. So that, that situation 
prohibits that judge or limits that judge's ability to really in, engage in a, a real strong voir dire and ask you questions and check on the, the veracity of your information, uh, the detail of your information, whether or not you use confidential informants, whether that, that confidential informant should be considered reliable, whether your information is reliable. You know, and if, if you had judges who realize that this should not be a routine process courtesy for law enforcement, but really treat very strictly and severely the examination of those applications, you would cut down tremendously on the number of, of warrants. If you use uh, what, what has come forward in dribs and drabs in regards to the Breonna Taylor case, for an example, there are elements, there's certain information and elements that were presented obviously to the judge that were inaccurate, that a simple idea perhaps could have discovered and the judge could have said, no, nah, I'm not signing that warrant. It, uh, there has to be expanded responsibility to the judiciary as well, you see, because that would result in more scrutiny to individual officers coming before you with the standard, you know, uh, uh, application for a search warrant, stating the same thing over and over again and getting them signed off to uh, then, uh, uh, you know, enter a people's uh, residence with no knock warrants. I see. So why don't we just create a judge just for this, uh, Mr. Kraska? Why don't we have it just a judge? You know, this might give me some legislation. I'm thinking about this stuff. Uh, I might mess around and, and come up with something. Mr. <laughs> Kraska, why don't we have just a judge um, to do this? I'm, I'm just worried about a, a judge who's too liberal or too conservative. How do you get the right judge, if you wish, um, on the issue? I don't care about his, poli his or her politics. I'm concerned right now about their mindset. Um, why don't we assign the judge just for no knock, slow knock, or any other type of, of knocks that we're doing? I, um, you know, I think, I mean, one of the difficulties is, is y'all know is we have 18,000 different police departments and, you know, all these jurisdictions and, and it's really, you know, it's so hard to, to come up with anything uniform and anything that's going to work. Um, as far as local jurisdictions, um, you know, I, you have to have that judge, you know, you have to have that judge in place that takes this seriously, but you know, there's an affliction in the criminal justice system. And it, 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 it happens in corrections, it happens at the court level, it happens with prosecutors, it happens in police, where when things become routinized and bureaucratized, people just lose their sense of what makes sense. They get so caught up in the daily, you know, minutia and boredom of the job. They're just like, you know what, whatever. Yep, you got the same language, that looks great sign the paperwork and move it on. You know, to create a sense of diligence, robustness, as Mr. Claxton said, veracity, you know, that's a really hard thing to maintain. Um, you know, particularly when people sit in these positions for a long time. So, you know, I think it's critical to get, to first of all, make law enforcement, the police department, because the police themselves are, are risk aversive in the in that they don't want to to create a big problem for themselves, and so if you create a a good clean protocol for the police to have to follow, that's that that has a clear application process and a rigorous application process, specific things that rein in what happens during the no knock or the knock and announce prosecution. What goes on? For example, why do you have to do this thing at four o'clock in the morning? Mm -hmm. If you're gonna do a regular knock and announce, why can't you just show up to the door at 4.30 in the afternoon and knock on the door like the constitution says you're supposed to and say, we're here to serve a search warrant. Now, if you think that place is so dangerous, you have reason to believe that people are gonna barricade themselves behind that door and there's gonna be a shootout, then you're not gonna to want to get a regular knock and announce anyway. Mm -hmm. 
put things in place that that make the police and and create a system of accountability where they have to really think about what they're doing and go through uh, specific steps. And then the last part of this is after the raid, after they conduct whatever knock and announce they, they engage in, uh, have it written out what they need in a detailed report that is made public. What occurred? Where's the body cam footage? What kinds of things, uh, who was there? Were there kids there? Were, were any weapons discharged at pets? This is a huge problem in the no knock and quick knock thing, the, the killing of pets. Uh, I worked uh, in a case in San Antonio where it was a regular knock and announce warrant. 30 SWAT officers showed up to two 18 uh, year old African American young men that were in the house, 30 officers showed up. They had no intention of conducting that as a knock and announce. No. Right? No. But that's the only warrant they had. They walk it in the front yard and they see those kids' dog walk away from them with its tail tucked between the legs. And one of the officers quick turns his heckler and cotch over, two bullets in it, and kills it. Just, you know, like that dog wasn't threatening. Nothing was happening. And then they took those two men out of the house, of course, with a, a high degree of force, nobody was killed, set them on the front porch right in front of that dog for two hours. Wow. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that when we talk about 60,000 of these raids a year, that's the kind of thing that particularly bothers me is sure some of them result in death but a lot of them result in people just being traumatized. Young people, uh, uh, elderly people, people that are innocent. You know, this whole confidential informant system where you show up and you're gonna try to find evidence, it, that's a hard thing to do in a clean way. And it's a hard thing to, to, to really nail down what you're gonna find in that place. And I guess that's by design. But boy, it should be done with the utmost caution and, and strict protocols in place. Mm -hmm. Mr. Claxon, I've been told that close to 90% of these no knocks are going for drugs. But I'm also, I, I mean, wouldn't it be just easy enough to cut off the, uh, the toilet system and therefore nobody can flush anything? And if that's the case, um, what? What do you need this for a drug raid, sir? I'm sorry, you, you, you stalled out for a second. The last thing I heard was, is, wouldn't it be simple to, to cut off like the floor, toilet system so that you couldn't flush or destroy evidence that way? And the, the answer is yes. As a matter of fact, depending on, you know, where you're, you're conducting your warrant, you know, there are options to do that. Here's the problem that you have when you're talking about cutting off utilities. Uh, one <laughs> big one is, if, suppose you're in, in, in a housing complex and you're doing a search warrant there. You necessarily have, you know, you don't want to end up impacting, you know, 100, 200, 300 people uh, just to locate or, or, or enter into one location. You can't just shut the power down for that particular house. So logistically it's difficult. And also it requires that you then for poli the police officers then coordinate with the utility services. And when you're conducting these type of, uh, of, of operations, you wanna keep it as tight and insolent as, as possible. So I don't necessarily wanna confer with Con Ed or whoever to, 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 to deal with the utility, key span, whoever, I don't wanna deal with them because it's a matter of the integrity of the operation itself. And sometimes, you know, from a logistical standpoint, it's just not practical to do uh, because you'd have to. I do want to touch on a couple of things. And Mr. Krask, as he was speaking, it, it popped into my head, if I may. Please do. Uh, Mr. Kraska made points early about the militarization of uh, search warrants. And I think that's, an, you know, militarization of, of policing. I think my organization has been discussing and talking about the over militarization of police forces for long period of time but in search warrants at least and I'll, I'll speak 
in regards to the NYPD because as Mr. Kraske indicated, you have so many different agencies and entities, everybody will do it differently, paperwork wise. I mean, the state is gonna control the court system generally, but as far as the individual municipalities, the paperwork that's generated and the requirements are very, very different. For example, the NYPD, after you conduct that search warrant, whatever you obtain, whatever information you get, you have to go back to court and, and present and explain it and, and show the documentation. If you vouch it, uh, items, if there was an arrest made, if there was a use of force, you have to really, you have to go back to court, return that warrant, and the paperwork will document the A, A through Z of what occurred during that uh, particular search warrant. Now, not every jurisdiction does that. But it, uh, additionally, the NYPD has gotten to the point where when I first started, and this is many years ago, I mean, you can tell by the grades, but when I uh, first started in the narcotics division and we did search warrants, the applications, we executed them ourselves. Uh, somewhere in the late 90s or so, the NYPD, for example, began to use the Special Forces, the Emergency Services Unit, for the entry of search warrants. So I go to court as the investigator. I present the information. I make the application for the search warrant. The judge signs off on, on my application based on the information I told them. And then I arrange for emergency services, the turtles, the the SWAT team, the militarized team to actually make the entry. And if you remember several years ago, there was so much uh, outrage about the use of, 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 of flashbangs and people were calling them percussion grenades, et cetera. That was because the entry was being made by the emergency services unit. So I, as the investigator, would be outside waiting for them to go through flashbang, everybody's down, the place is cleared, and then I would go in and do my searching, et cetera. You know, they would have already cleared the house. So that's another element. And you see, if that's the case, you know, you, you, you have a situation where investigators uh, are, would be more likely to get more warrants because it's actually less work for them. All I'm doing is paperwork and going before a judge. I'm sitting back and waiting for the emergency service to do all the dangerous work in essence. So it, it you know, the fact that it's done that way and, it's, and it's, it's, of course, it's an overuse of the militarized apparatus in the police department, but it also would encourage uh, lazy investigators, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. to, to apply for more search warrants because they're doing much less work. They're not fully responsible for, with the danger of the entry itself, identif mm -hmm. identification of perpetrators immediately. We're walking in after emergency services does all the dirt and they leave. So there, there's, there's other levels of accountability that kind of are, are, are sacrificed when you do it that way. So that's another a component that needs to be examined uh, and discussed is, is how you actually do the, the, the warrants themselves. Well, is it a question, Mr. Kraska, of, of lazy investigators or is it a systemic problem? Is it uh, uh, just a couple of lazy individuals or is there a problem in the, in the system? No, I, I, you know, I've got a national gaze on this and, you know, that's, that's what I'm paid to do is to look at it from a big picture standpoint. And there's no doubt it's systemic. I mean, you, you have, um, I mean, one of the things, and that's fascinating, Mark, I, I appreciate that the insight on that. One of the things you have with your medium and smaller police departments is a, a kind of a similar problem, but you have the drug enforcement teams trying to play SWAT. Yes. And so they've become, you know, what we call more tactical or militarized, and they get to do the fun stuff. And, and, and let's just be clear here. For a lot of these, these officers, this is fun. This is recreational. It's dangerous as hell, sure. but for them, it's a rush. It's an adrenaline rush. You get to wear the 21st century cyborg gear. You know, you get to do stuff that no other police get to do. In fact, you get to be the elite. You get to be the Navy SEALs of policing. And so that, that whole paradigm, that military model approach starts to trickle down 
to other officers in the department. It's no longer centered in the SWAT team or the emergency response team. And so the whole department, not the whole department always, but a lot of the times, a lot of the department, they start to start thinking more tactically and wanting to dress more tactically. And they start pounding on the chief of police door saying, you know what? I, I need to go to this training that Heckler and Koch or Smith and Wesson puts on. And, you know, I want to learn this stuff like they do. And, and that's one of the things that's happened with the insidious thing that's happened with police militarization is all this activity with no knock warrants and drug raids and all that has created a culture that has trickled into much of the rest of police departments where they all start thinking more tactically. When they pull, when they pull somebody over, they're thinking, wow, this could be a tactical situation. This person could be a, essentially a combatant that I've got to neutralize and I've got to be on guard just like that. And I think that's a big part of the cultural problem that's plaguing contemporary policing today that you have a lot more officers and a lot more entrenched culture of sort of we against them. And it's us, the tactical mindset against the dangerous public. And uh, boy, when we get there, we're in bad shape. It's funny. Are we getting there, Mr. Claxton? Are we, yeah. are we, um, does everybody want to be the Marines? Does everybody want to be, you know, SWAT? I mean, every cop wants to be, Captain America? Mr. Kraft is pulling me right over the line. He's got me right at the edge of that, that toe line. You're right over the line. <laughs> well, that, that's why we had this show, sir, to pull you over. I'm, I'm fighting, back, <laughs> trying to make my point to bring me back. Uh, but uh, he made excellent points. He's absolutely right that that type of uh, uh, militarization and that mindset it, it becomes kind of infectious in agencies. Um, and just to prove a point, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because I have a, a, a relative who is in the NYPD and who sent me a picture last week at one of some demonstration that was going on. He's in a group that's called the Strategic Response Group, which mm -hmm. is are the individuals who now go to these different demonstrations and protests, et cetera. And there he had, you know, the Kevlar padding et cetera, helmets. And really in my time, in my day, like I tell them, my day within the emergency services were the only militarized tactical guys. But now in different agencies, you see that kind of militarized look and, and, and operation going on. Now here's my relative who has three and a half years uh, in the police department, uh, but is assigned to strategic response group uh, and look, you know, had the whole outfit. Very impressive. Very, very good looking. Sure. And yes, a lot of a lot of times, uh, police officers. You know, a lot of people getting to get into policing because they like the adventure of it. Um, younger police officers. The older you get, and the longer you're in the department, the less attractive those type of assignments are for you, because uh, you recognize your restrictions. Uh, but uh, for younger police officers and those coming into the in department, it's understandable that that could be very, you know, enticing, the physicality of it, you know, the, the swattish nature of it. And so whatever organizations, whatever um, groups within that particular agency will allow you to operate in a different way than just regular foot patrol, you kind of tend to move towards that. So Mr. Kraska is absolutely right, you know, about that, uh, uh, that aspect of it. It is uh, kind of seeping throughout the department. And it was supported and sped up by the federal government making so much of the military uh, equipment available for nothing, really encouraging departments to come and get this tank off our hands, this surplus tank. And, you know, let's, let's make this happen where you had what should have been just foot patrol at particular locations, demonstrations and protests, you had tanks rolling down the middle of the street. And when you do that, you, 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 you really impact the public perception about what policing is, how police can be trusted, because police are not meant to be military. Mm -hmm. It's paramilitary, 
uh, but and and you being a veteran, uh, uh, Senator, I, I know you understand. You know there are there's a huge difference between yeah. the responsibilities of of policing and our military, and you shouldn't mix those because those are mixed mm -hmm. messages that mm -hmm. you're sending to mm -hmm. a, a very impressionable population who mm -hmm. at at the current time doesn't necessarily trust you as much a, a, as you would like to be effective. So it it really is something that needs to. Well, either he spoke so well, or he was, uh, he crossed, the, he said he was going to cross a line, but I, <laughs> but, I, but I didn't think that big brother would, would grab him that quick. I, I said, let's be clear, but <laughs> maybe we shouldn't be that clear. Now, you, you're right, uh, Brother Claxton, that as a Marine, uh, I'm a Marine, Mr. Mr. Krask, I'm a, I'm a Marine. And I'm a I'm a Marine grunt. I I mean, they um, we didn't go there to talk to people. We're not we're not there to be social workers or to you know hand out lollipops and and man, we're going in there to crush anything that moves. If it moves, it loses. I mean, you know, it, it, when we say we believe. <laughs> We believe in gun control. We mean the ability to hit our targets. Trigger, I mean, trigger control. Yeah, we're we're we. So you really don't you don't want to you don't want to bring Marines home to your family, and you don't and you don't want to bring them to your community unless you really do. You really don't want to bring these guys out because um. You know, we believe, <laughs> well, you know, kill them all. Let God sort them out. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that goes into the police, and that is not the, A, perhaps it shouldn't be the thinking of the Marines, but B, it certainly should not be the thinking of the police. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. it, but is that, is that, is it that type of thinking too far, too spread Mr. Kraska, and if, and if it is, how do we pull back from that? It's a real difficult problem because, you know, getting that, the, you know, the proverbial toothpaste back in the tube, it's tough. I mean, once that, once that cultural mindset takes hold and, you know, you become a warrior, you yes. become, you know, you become that, you know, serious person that's, you know, all about danger and neutralizing threats and, you know, that's hard to turn that back around and say, no, you're actually you're supposed to be serving the community. And these are your fellow citizens. You're supposed to be helping out. And yes, sometimes arresting, but you can't do it with a militarized mindset. You know, it, 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 to bring it all back to the no-knock thing, it's kind of interesting. Because if we did a thought experiment and we said, if we, if we did a thought experiment and, and we passed legislation, let's say, a state or a local jurisdiction, and it really reigned in quick knock and no knock raids. In other words, these tactical raids, I would call them militarized raids, got cut by 90%. I would submit that that would go a long ways towards demilitarizing a police department because what it would do is it would take SWAT teams, ERE team, ERT teams, and it would bring them back and a lot of them want this, by the way, 50% of the SWAT community wants this, to go back to the days where they handled pre-existing dangerous situations, like a hostage or like an actor.